Hi everyone, it's great to meet you. I am super excited to be here with a group of fellow EBPF enthusiasts. And I'm sure I am preaching to the choir when I say that EBPF is going to be the most important uh, tool in uh, dev tools. But I may not be preaching to the choir when I say the next part, which is that it will be the most important solution that nobody has heard of. And I believe we should keep it that way. So uh, I, uh, like most of you here, I started out, um, or like many of you here, I started out following a common eBPF playbook, which is you build something cool with eBPF because you realize all the things that Brendan has talked about. eBPF is super powerful. It lets you do mission impossible type of things. It lets you get in there, really understand your system. And then um, I waited for uh, you know the the profit part to happen, and I realized that there there have to be a few more steps for eBPF to really become the uh, the under underpinning technology for some very powerful uh, tools. And so um, this talk, uh, the, be the beginnings of this talk really came about uh, at one point last year when I was sort of just going around saying, hey, we have this cool eBPF based tool. And I really wasn't getting a lot to work with um, in, the, in the general public. And I, um, as a former scientist, I formed a hypothesis that maybe eBPF, the word, uh, the term alone isn't enough to, to draw crowds. I did a few Twitter polls, and um, it turns out that eBPF is not a very popular term uh, outside of this community, uh, which I think is not a showstopper. This actually started a really interesting conversation between uh, Bill Mulligan, who is um, a, a, a core member of the eBPF community and me, and that is what led to this talk. So this talk is going to be about my personal story about how I identified one of these problems that seemed really, really hard, if not impossible to solve otherwise. I had come upon eBPF as a solution to this problem for myself. I um, encountered some obstacles, including, you know, people thinking the term eBPF is boring, but then there, there's some more uh, serious technical obstacles in there too. I came away still believing that eBPF is really going to be the thing, but um, I have some thoughts on uh, how, how we as a community can overcome these obstacles to have eBPF underpin everything. And um, as you can tell, I don't have um, a, a graphic designer at my beck and call to do these slides, so I made this really beautiful graphic myself. Uh, you, you guys can feel free to reuse it. Um, and first, just a little bit about me, because you might be wondering who's this gene person, um, you know, what, what's she doing telling us about eBPF, we know way more. Um, so uh, I came from a programming languages research background. I was a tenure track professor at Carnegie Mellon in the programming languages group. I left academia to start a company called Akita Software that is a uh, was based on using eBPF to do drop-in API monitoring. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got there, lessons we learned there. A lot of my eBPF-related lessons are around Akita. And I'm currently the head of product and observability at Postman. So Akita got acquired by Postman earlier this year. We've been integrating our eBPF-based technology there. Um, if you uh, want to work on this and you're looking for somewhere to work, reach out to me. Um, I am pretty easy to find on the internet, although I now realize I didn't put on the slides how to find me. Uh, you can find me on the Slack later. But um, yeah, I would, I would really be curious to hear uh, from all of you about your experiences around eBPF2 because I have just one set of experiences here. All right, so my whole relationship with eBPF started with um, a lot of software teams telling me we don't know often what's going on with our software systems. So this is actually the reason I left academia to work on dev tools and industry. I, I was working on type systems, static analysis, dynamic analysis, pretty fancy stuff. And um, people just kept on telling me, Gene, everything you're saying is great, but you know, we don't really know what we're running or where it's running or a bunch of pretty basic things about our system. So can't really do much until we figure that out. And so, um, 
you know, I, I dug in a little more and the software teams that I was uh, looking to get feedback from in, in industry would, would always tell me, well, we don't know what endpoints we have or when something bad happens with one of the endpoints. And I would say, well, what about all of the monitoring and observability tools that you already have? You know, there's Datadog, that's pretty popular. New Relic was very popular at the time. Um, it just seemed like, you know, people, people should have things more under control than what I was hearing from software teams. All right, cool. So where I left off was, um, you know, I discovered people don't know as much about their systems as they would hope or I would hope. I asked, what about all the tools you have? And um, I learned that the state of logging and monitoring today is um, much more manual than I would have thought before I dug into this problem. And so what people told me was like, the existing solutions are great if I know what I wanna track and how to track it. So I know exactly what dashboard I want to monitor something because I know which endpoints I have and want to monitor. And um, alternatively, I know exactly what I want out of traces I'm getting out of my system. Uh, you know, using something like LightStep or Honeycomb is great for that. What people told me was if they want information out of their system they didn't predict or there's part of their underlying system they don't know exactly uh, what it looks like or even that it's there, things get much harder. And then what I was hearing was very smart people were telling me, hey, I don't have the kind of control I would like over my system. And what I discovered is if you aren't the person who originally built the system, and especially if the people who originally built the system aren't there, it gets even harder. So imagine a company that was started you know, 15, 20 years ago, many companies are uh, fit that profile today. Um, uh, one of our Akita users that did a blog post with us about this problem is Flickr. You know, every, everyone has seen it. Everyone has seen it for, you know, 10, 15 plus years. And um, what they told me was, look, we have a lot of endpoints that, that have been around since the beginning of time and uh, or beginning of Flickr time. And it's not easy for us to use these modern tools to understand what's going on because there's stuff that's not as well documented as we've liked. There's stuff that we don't know all the details of how it works. And so that led me to uh, the problem statement for what we were building at Akita. First of all, we wanted as little install friction as possible. We learned that, especially on these systems where people didn't have their heads around the entire system, needing to instrument the code or needing to uh, uh, needing even to drop in a library, which means updating a bunch of other code dependencies, was not tenable. We wanted to be as accessible as possible to developers who don't fully understand their own systems. So especially with the increased churn in the software industry, the rise of junior teams, and just um, the general aging of the software industry, or I guess the maturation of the software industry, um, there's, um, you know, th there, there's just a lot more barrier to entry for, for, you know, people understanding their own systems. And we wanted to introduce as few new concepts as possible, because what we saw was Developers who are working to ship and maintain on systems that they don't completely understand, they're often overloaded in other ways too. And this is how we came upon eBPF. Uh, it's very powerful. You know, everything Brendan said, you get all kinds of information at system and networking levels. It's versatile. You have applications and performance, security, and more. Brendan gave a great talk. I won't repeat it. Um, and also, I just uh, want to point out using eBPF made a lot of sense for us. Uh, you, you never look dumb by using eBPF. If Datadog, F5, VMware, Cloudflare, they're all rolling out uh, their eBPF offerings. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, there's buzz for a reason. It's a very useful, powerful software. So we just thought, hey, you know, this is super cool. eBPF solves all of our problems, we think. Let's go with it. And then we rolled out V0 of our solution and we learned some things. So the initial feedback, uh, so what we did was we rolled out a solution that used eBPF to watch all of the API traffic of a system. Then we showed users, here's all of the API traffic that you've seen. And uh, they said, look, look guys, we came to you to be less overwhelmed, not more overwhelmed. And our first response was, wait a minute, you said you wanted to understand everything about your system. You didn't understand it. And they were like, 
yeah, maybe there's a reason. <laughs> we, we didn't try to understand the, the whole thing. And so the first piece of feedback we got when we started using eBPF was what's all this data? And so one thing we learned is if you're using another solution, like if you're using Honeycomb, which requires you to instrument your endpoints and then it shows you which endpoints you instrumented, it's very hard to get overwhelmed because what you get is what you put in. And so people can't easily get themselves to a place where just way too much data is being thrown at them. What we found was when we started using eBPF to show people everything that was going on, this quickly became overwhelming because people were like, oh my gosh, I have 10,000 endpoints in my system I didn't know about. Maybe I should just turn this off and not know about it again. So they told us, you know, we came to you to have an easier life. We don't want to see more information about our systems that we don't have time to make sense of. And so we learned one danger of, you know, this power of seeing everything about your system is if people don't know what to do with it, they would rather not know. And then um, the other big piece of feedback was, uh, a lot of our users who actually showed up before we started really using this word eBPF all over the place said, it doesn't sound like eBPF is for me. And so there was a period of time when we realized, oh, wow, this eBPF technology we're using, it's very hot. Lots of other people are excited about it. And so we put this big, you know, powered by eBPF on our website and we actually saw fewer, fewer signups. So i um, we, uh, it was primarily eBPF enthusiasts and security people who knew they were looking for eBPF. And when we dug in with our existing users who had signed up before, what they said was, look, um, it, you know, it, it sounds, we, we didn't know what eBPF was before we started using you guys. We came to you because you advertised low friction install and all this other stuff. And, um, you know, it, it's not a technology we really identify with as being for us. And so we went back to the drawing board after this and, you know, it, we said it seems like we should address this first question of this eBPF based solution throwing too much data at the users. And so we came to see eBPF as a low friction data source, but it's just the beginning of what we're doing with the data. So we integrated our agent to watch API traffic at the network level. I'll point out we're primarily using BPF and not the extended features. Um, while we spent a lot of time automating around agent install. So one thing we found was people would say, okay, drop in, but drop in where? Turned out our initial solution required people to know how they deployed Kubernetes or how they were deploying whatever they were deploying. So we spent a lot of time automating the install of the, the BPF-based solution on top of that. And then um, we also spent a lot of time, one to two years actually, uh, building algorithms to analyze the eBPF data so that we were showing less of it. So we built algorithms to automatically detect endpoint structure, endpoints of interest, so which endpoints are slow, which endpoints are, th are throwing errors. We spent a lot of time doing uh, UX work to show people fewer endpoints up front so as not to overwhelm them. And um, then, uh, th th then that really cut down on the amount of information we were starting to, to give to users. And so what eBPF ultimately allowed us to do at Akita was it uh, allowed us to build a solution that required very little work to set up. So we were able to let people integrate within uh, five to 20 minutes. They could drop us in. Uh, I would say a lot of that uh, cutting down the onboarding time was automation around the install of eBPF and not so much you know, using eBPF to do more. Uh, eBPF also allowed us to require very little work or expertise to, to have users get value out of our system. So after we implemented the algorithms to analyze the eBPF data, people were able to uh, install us and start seeing their slowest endpoints or their endpoints with errors within five minutes of install. And that was really the magical moment. And uh, once we got all this in place, we were able to appeal to overwhelmed developers by automatically staying up to date with changes. And so uh, something that we did a lot of work on was figuring out how to alert people what was new about the whole setup so they didn't have to figure out where to look. And um, the lesson there was we just didn't mention eBPF. We said, look, you can install us in 30 minutes. You can get results in five minutes and we keep you up to date. And those, those ended up being the, the things that, that you know, led, led to uh, the, the step three profit, not the declaration of use of eBPF itself. 
So I think we're, you know, as much as I like to think we're special, I, I think that our, our story is probably not unique in the greater community. And so I will, uh, I'll just sum up a couple lessons from us. First, eBPF alone doesn't make developer experience better. So initially we just thought this is such a powerful solution. Dropping it in should be enough. Uh, working on install and working on algorithms for better consuming the data were really key for us. Um, something that was surprising to me was eBPF was not only not a positive for our users, many of them, it was a negative because they would hear it say, I don't get it and think that the tool would be hard to use. And so actually moving away from saying eBPF was very important uh, for us. And there are very hard technical developer experience problems around eBPF. I know a lot of the last few years has been about getting the technology more stable, uh, getting more, more data in to the eBPF data source. But I really hope the next five, 10 years is about getting, uh, getting some of these rough edges smoothed around use. And I really believe if we do all that, eBPF is going to take over everything. I think eBPF is incredible for its ability to let people drop into solutions. I believe eBPF will become mainstream when the developer experience becomes accessible enough for mainstream developers. I think we're getting there. I don't think we're there yet. And I also believe that we will have succeeded when most developers haven't heard of eBPF at all. Just like Intel inside isn't really a thing, like no one knows really what chips are being used inside. I, I think one day there's going to be eBPF underlying a lot of tools that want this frictionless install, that want this magic five, uh, five minute or less onboarding. And it's going to be up to us as a tool development community to really build the algorithms and the developer experience to make that accessible. So I'm super excited to be part of this community. I'd love to hear from all of you your ideas around making eBPF more accessible. And I really think that we're going to take over the world. Couldn't agree more. That was a tremendous talk. And thank you so much for, uh, you know, coming back and just like, you know, being able to pick up the pieces and keep going. That was amazing. Like, <laughs> it's really hard to do. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah. Let's see what we had some questions that came up uh, during your talk, which I thought would be worth like bringing up here. One of the questions was from Dan saying, what process, what was your process for automating the install of eBPF? Because as you pointed out, there's definitely difficulties around it. Uh, that is a great question. And I wish I had a shorter answer, but um, the, the long answer is per platform very carefully. And so for every single platform, there's kind of a set of permissions that you need to get libpcap install, et cetera, yeah. uh, to figure out what version people are running. And so it was really just, you know, burning down uh, all of the, the manual steps of install and, and automating them. And, and we're not, we're not all the way done yet. We're, you know, it's just, it's very uh, painful in per platform, but at least it's pain on our side and not our user side. That makes sense. Another great question uh, um, from Hachik saying probably a new question, but is watching traffic via Akita eBPF better than using something like Datadog and why? Uh, that's a great question. So Datadog also has an eBPF based solution or several. Um, I think they have golden signals and they're, they're also doing some things with AP, uh, API observability. I would say, you know, watching traffic is watching traffic. Uh, for Akita's marketing, I, I always said we're not the only eBPF based solution, but we've put the most time into automatically analyzing the traffic that we see to make life easier for you. And so I think that eventually the dif the differentiator isn't going to be in eBPF itself, but how different tools are using that data to make life easier for you. And every tool is going to have optimized for a different dimension of ease. And um, some tools are going to have just straight up spent more time on it. So I would say a lot of the feedback we got even about Datadog was people were spending weeks to quarters uh, setting up all the dashboards they needed. There was, um, you know, there, there, there isn't as much automation as, as some of the teams that we were finding needed. Yeah. yeah, I mean, figuring out like what questions you want to ask of all of that data, is definitely a whole other challenge. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so one of our goals was um, for people who don't know what questions they ask, we just would pre present them with, here's a initial set of questions. You're probably going to yeah. graduate out of this pretty quickly, we hope. But, you know, we, we get a you A place started. to start. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Well, I want to say thank you again so much for, for joining us. Um, there's some great topics happening in the chat, so feel free to jump in there. Um, and I would like to introduce the next talk that is coming up. This will be